Barrett, thank you so much for doing this, man. It's a uh, huge honor to have you. Thanks for having me. Um, this, uh, you know, I know a lot of people that have been lifting weights for several years, but, you know, not many people who have been lifting weights since 1970 researching this thing and learning through trial and error the way that you have. Yeah. And training people. I've been a personal trainer since 1990. Yeah. The professor of the National Personal Training Institute since 2001. Yeah. Which, you know, makes you pretty unique in the sense of, like, there's a lot of people training people, but not a lot of people that train or, or that are teaching personal trainers. You know, I walked into your office the other day, there's like three bookshelves filled to the brim with just informative books and informative training DVDs. Yep. And if, if you don't know, I think this is important, if you don't know what the National Personal Training Institution is, um, what it is, is literally like a human factory for anybody that has any aspiration to become a personal trainer. Mm -hmm. And this can be for someone of any age, uh, you can actually be an existing personal trainer who wants to learn more. You can be someone who just wants to get in shape. Um, you could be, you know, a, a, a high school student like myself in 2008 um, when I met you and I attended the school. Uh, and it's set up in a format of 500 hours of anatomy, um, physiology, nutrition, energy systems. I mean, if you're even remotely thinking about training someone, or you're into fitness at all. Like you walk into this place, it's Disney World for personal trainers. It's like you walk <laughs> in and it's this little classroom in the back of the world's gym on the boulevard in Philly where there's whiteboards with just workouts and program designs all over them. There's little skeletons that you're learning anatomy on. There's like one piece of exercise equipment like ever made ever that you get to try things on. Um, most importantly, you get to learn from, from you. Um, you know, people ask me all the time, like, Derek, where did, where did you learn all this stuff? And I'm like, Barry Fritz, man. You know, I think that the National Personal Training Institution is a step that if you want to be a legitimate trainer, if you, you know, if you want to be a high-level trainer, you cannot skip. You have to, you have to go there. Um, and also, just the practical aspect of the school as yes. well, just extremely important. I mean, the amount of mistakes that you get to work, to get to make while working with other trainers and to learn by doing that you get to make well before you go into the real life of actually training people, you know? Um, and one of the biggest things that I think sets apart students of, uh, or any MPTI grad versus just, you know, not that it's better or worse, but just uh, a generic training certification is the fact that how universal the trainers are and the fact that, you know, any MPTI grad can work with any person and justify every single exercise that they do, why they do it, how to do it. It doesn't matter if your goals are fat loss, it doesn't matter if you're a high level athlete, it doesn't matter if you know, you're a beginner to fitness. Like again, I think it's a step that you can't skip. And actually one thing I've always wondered from you, just watching you as you know, passionate as you teach, um, like what is your goal as the teacher of the National Personal Training Institute to, to, to like your students? Like what are you trying to put out there for your personal trainers in the world of, of personal trainers. Yeah, so very important when a student leaves, day one, they're confident, mm -hmm. all right? So they have the background in, in lecture, but like you said, a big part of our school, it makes us different than the certification where they send you a book. You're actually training somebody, mm -hmm. all right? Or being trained. And what we try to do is every two weeks, we switch to another trainer so, or another client. So the first three months of the course, you're the trainee. Mm -hmm. And then after those three months, you're now the trainer. And then every two weeks, you get a new client. So with new goals, with new problems, you know, what's, what's our issues, right? So that's big. So the first person you train in your new job, your new career, is you've already trained people. Mm -hmm. All right, so there, there's the confidence level. And this has been said to me a lot. You know, we give you a good foundation, but there's no way we give it to you all, everything. Mm -hmm. now, I don't know everything. None of us know any, everything, right? So, but it gives you the... The, the, the backup, the foundation to continue learning when you leave, all right? And that's big. So you just continue to learn and learn more and learn more. And then you get to rationalize this, what that person's saying. Like there's things like I hear a PhD said, and I go, you know, that's okay, but I don't know if I agree with that, right? It doesn't make me right, doesn't make him wrong, but it, I'm thinking like, is that is that right? And that's what every student should be, all right? And then you said also the protocol, you're just not gonna put it, like what comes to your head, you just put it down on a piece of paper and that's what we're gonna do. 
there's a purpose, right? There was a soccer coach, I steal his line. And he said, when you <laughs> kick the ball for a purpose, mm. like, you know how kids sometimes the ball comes to what's the first thing they do? Kick it away, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 but then why'd you put that exercise down? What's the rationale for that exercise? Right. right? As opposed to like, why did you do it? Well, I like to do that. Well, that means nothing possibly to your client. Right. You know, so there's, that's again, I'm being redundant, but you know, just have a purpose with exercise selection. So you think that's one of the most important things about, uh, like, do you consider that to be one of the most important things to getting good at training, the, being a personal trainer, of actually like getting your hands dirty and training people? Absolutely. And actually training yourself and doing the things that, that or, or practicing what you preach? Absolutely. I mean, there, there, was a, there was a guy in North Jersey, Joe DeFranco, all right? And I, I would think of either Facebook or uh, Instagram, and I see his blurbs every once in a while, right? And he said something, for every hour you learn in a book, you should be spending an hour and a half in the gym and actually practicing what you're learning. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's not all, like book knowledge is great, you know what I mean, so it's, you cannot have enough, but you've got to also learn in the gym. So this person doesn't tell it right, what are you going to do as a personal trainer to help correct that, that mechanic, all right? So the biomechanics of the exercise is fault, faulty. So what are you going to do, right? There has to be a plan, there has to be some rationale, what am I going to do? Yeah. As opposed to, hmm, they're doing it wrong. I think that's the biggest, um, difference between an MPTI grad um, is the fact that the regressions and the progressions yeah, are so large and come at such a high pace and the ability again like I said to, to work with any client of any goal yeah. and your ability to keep people safe and yeah. keep people effective and program design actually get someone from point A to point B you know yeah so but what, what if it's something that you never heard of before you know and, I, and uh, so now you have the ability to research it right and you now you want to read the what you're, what you're researching the issue, and then you can interpret it and make some sense out of it. For sure, right? So that's really big too, because like I said, we don't we don't know it all. So your clients actually force you to learn even more. One hundred percent. You know, so it's it's a great learning tool. For it's sure. Just, like I, I tell students all the time, your lab is a gym. Yeah. Right. And then it's so important for the students to take advantage of that of that laboratory time. We call it practical. So constant listening to podcasts, constant going to seminars, constant research. But then going out and doing it. Yeah. Like if you see an exercise, go out and do it. And the client says like pull through, right? So pull through, it's a hip hinge exercise for glutes for the most part, a little hamstring, all right? And then somebody says set it up with an internally rotated hip. And then somebody else will say do it with a right. lally rotated hip. I hear yeah. that with nutrition all the time. People are like, what do yeah. I do? Yeah. 40 so now you, you make the rationale. <laughs> right. Because right? right? it's, it's not an exercise where you necessarily can rotate your hip while you're doing it. Yeah. So your setup is fixed. Now, you can set it up, for, like you do four sets, you could do it with an internally rotated hip and then with a lally rotated hip. Right. You know? So there's pros and cons to both. Like sure. it, it's always good to train a muscle long and short. And then if you can do it in the same exercise, that's, that's great. But you can't always do it. There's a perfect example why you can't do it that way. Right. You know? what, why did you start lifting? Uh, football. Yeah. Yeah. So be stronger. Yeah. So I was getting beat by bigger, stronger guys, and I wasn't the biggest, strongest guy in the world. Like genetically, I just wasn't that big and strong. So if I wanted to compete in football, I had to get stronger. Right. And then it was, it's funny because my football coach initially said, "Don't do that. It's going to make you slow." <laughs> right. Like every, all of a sudden, I'm going to be like Arnold Schwarzenegger. That was a big thing right? for a while. Though. Oh, so big. Right. It, it happened for several years afterwards. Right. But here, here's what happened. So my performance from my sophomore year to my senior year, don't get me wrong, I grew too, obviously. Right. But I went from like a 145 pound kid, 155 pound kid that got thrown around like a dish rag to a guy who was able to compete at a, at a, at a decent level. You know, so then my football coach comes up to me, Mike Pettin Sr. actually, he's pretty legendary in the Boylestown area. All right, we were undefeated, which was cool. All right, but he comes up to me and says, hey Fritz, there might be something to this bodybuilding you're doing. Why don't you try to get these, you to get these other guys doing what you're doing, right? So that was kind of like, hey, that'd be kind of cool. So you're trying to get guys, I didn't know what I was doing. I was reading a magazine, you know, and then Strength and Health was big back then. Iron Man was big back then. Were you reading like Arnold Schwarzenegger? And like, yeah. Well, what, what exactly were you doing? So like, I was just basically reading articles. Yeah. But then, then, then the next gym, I, so the first gym I went into was a barn. And if you were ever a student, <laughs> you heard a story, got, I don't know how many times, there's so many stories in this gym. But there was no fixed dumbbells. If you wanted a 25 pound dumbbell, you made it. There was no welding. Not that. No, nothing, nothing, was, nothing was welding. Right. Yeah, you know, there was all just wood. 
There was incline benches, but they were fixed. You didn't lost those shit. Right. Yeah, it was it was a great atmosphere, and then, the gym had a great atmosphere. And then you would come in. The first thing we come into was there was a pivot point and a pulley, and guys would just come in here to do this because they would practice all week, right, getting stronger for arm wrestling, and they would go out and, and win, you know, arm wrestling tournaments or win a beer or win a bet. You know, who's going to bet the arm wrestling? That's what they would do. You would work, have your whole, whole workout done. They're still in there, really rotating, really rotating. <laughs> how, so, how do you train today? So today, well, I'm 60, so time went fast. Wow. So, um, I'm 60 years old, and 1974 was my last football game at 16 years old as a senior. And it seems like I was just 16 years old, and, and it was yesterday. You know, so time goes really fast. But the point is, now you're 60, and um, so now it's not heavy, heavy, heavy. Mm. I really could care less, you know, how heavy I train, mm-hmm. right? So, but now it's more volume oriented and then focus oriented. So, and I, like, like I train my clients too, right? So we, you know, we talk about a bench press. Yeah, you can just move a bench press from point A to point B, and it's good form. And there's a way to do it for strength, but then there's also a way for doing it for maximizing the contraction. So it's, instead of just, pushing the bar from point A to point B, mm-hmm. focus on your elbows coming towards the center of the body. All right, so really contracting that muscle. You gotta really put your head into the muscle that you're, you're training, all right? So feeling the muscle mass. Absolutely, so some, like I have, a, I have a client now, she, and she's great at it, and, uh, and there's a couple that are really good at it, actually, but she'll say to me, Barry, this is too heavy, I can't feel the contraction. So she basically wants to feel the contraction on every rep, and if she can, it looks form looks fine, not doing a lateral raise, but she can't contract like she wants to because it's too heavy. So we just lighten it up, right? Like I, I tell everybody all the time, like if you can't activate your lats, come here like this and just subtly extend your arm, right? And then just pull it, subtly internally rotate it, and then wrap it around your body and then really feel that lat. I had a class do that, their lats were sore that very next day <laughs> with out a weight in their hand. Now put a weight in it. So do that exact same thing and now put a weight into it or a pulley system into it. Do you think that's one of the reasons why people are so prone to injury? Because a lot of people don't want to, A, you know, do the form correctly or maybe you know, use the proper weight to where you actually feel the right, the primary mover needing to do the work and you just go too heavy and then you start using joints instead of muscles. And yeah, and it could, that's definitely one way, just improper mechanics. Yeah. You know, because like if a beginner, I don't tell a beginner to do that, it's just information over. Right. right. So what the heck are you talking about? You know. So I'm just trying to get the form down right. You know, good body position. Boom, we're golden, right? Then as they start getting more body awareness, then I start adding some things, right? So if it's a row, maybe spread the bar, or if I'm using a machine, extend your shoulder a little bit before you pull it back. So all these little, all these little uh, cues make it different. So the row continues, right? Like somebody, one of my clients said to me one time said. I never realized there was so much a bob with a stinking rub. Right. But you can make it a you can make it a lot more to just take proper form and move it back towards your torso. So for preventing injury, proper progression is crucial. Absolutely, proper mechanics and mobility is a big. So one thing that's changed since I was lifted, you didn't care about mobility. 1973. <laughs> the only thing that matters. rollers and uh, hell tissue no. work, <laughs> work, flossing. What the hell am I wasting my time for that for? You know what I mean? By the time I do that, I could have my workout done. You know. But, uh, do you so, find them? Do you find them important though? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, as you get older, you, you tighten up. Like I probably should not deadlift without doing mobility work. I should not even look at the at the, uh, the platform. Like getting your hips loose. Yeah, and, absolutely. You know. Right. So I definitely got to get that done. Mm-hmm. And so then that's a big part of what we teach in, in school too. You know? All the uh, yeah, the prehabilitation stuff. You know, I you know the, listen. The real world is people coming in like. You know, Derek, I hurt my elbow today. Okay, well then I guess we're not doing chin-ups even though I had chin-ups planned for today. Mm-hmm. And the ability to, what you've taught us with all the band flossing and tissue work and, you know, almost like rehabilitation. I know we're not certified, no. you know, rehab in that degree, mm-hmm. but like understanding what to do with that person to get them to be able to train that day, be yeah. beneficial, not go, you know, and go home feeling better and then still being able to be productive so that they can benefit and move closer to their goals. I think that's, you know, again, another huge thing to go into MPTI. Yeah, like, look, look at look what people do all day. They sit. Mm. Right, look at my position right now. This is horrible, right? So my scapula is protracted, right? My my shoulders are newly rotated. My hip is flexed, and now I'm going to go deadlift. Eh, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> you know, we may have to change that a little bit. Right. You know what I mean, so there's definitely if you do that every day, day in and day out, 
you want to start creating muscle imbalances, so you have to work at it. You know, for you sure. Have time to work at it. Um, how do you eat today? Like what? It, what have, yeah, so that's changed, that changes over the years, right? So when I was younger, um, I, I would say it was more high, higher carb and moderate amount of protein, and that worked for me. I mean, I would get look good, perform well. You know, and then I guess in my 40s, I started, I started first noticing in the morning. Mm -hmm. I was wake, would wake up where I was always just like shot out of a cannon, and I would start feeling a little sluggish after breakfast. All right? okay. and, and my breakfast was always the same, which was, you know, the uh, steel cut oatmeal with some berries, you know, strawberries, blueberries, cranberries, some almonds, livers, and I would have some eggs. And then I just said, ah, oh, man, I feel, feel tired, I'm feeling tired, not feeling like I should, right? So I guess I got rid of the the steel cut oatmeal. And then I felt immediately better. And then so instead of the, the uh, steel cut oatmeal, I put an avocado in with my eggs for breakfast. But when I'm in a rush, I eat sardines right out of the can. Right? So <laughs> in every way, every way of class, like, they know I knew that, right? Because I'll be in the lunchroom eating this. Yeah, I walked in the other day with <laughs> rotisserie chicken yeah, and yeah, utensils. Yeah. So you took away uh, grain, you took away carbs, like yeah. breads and yeah. even oatmeal and yeah. even 100% whole wheat bread. Yeah. So it's more of a keto approach? Yeah, like I'm not exact, I'm not keto exactly right now, but you know, if I want to get myself in shape, and I don't even, to be honest with you, for me personally, I'm not saying it's for you, I'm not saying for it's for anyone else, but I don't know why I go out of keto. Now and when I, you say keto, what is your definition of keto, just for people that don't So, know. so keto, ketogenic diet basically is potatoes, forget about it. Fruit, maybe some berries. You know, maybe some strawberries, maybe some blueberries, maybe some raspberries, that's about it. But that's when you're keto adapted, which means you're using fat as fuel as opposed to carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. All right, and then a uh, moderate amount of protein, and and then you know it, it really works. you people say, how, how do you know you're in ketosis? I know mentally when I'm in ketosis. I, I tease my students all the time. Lionel's coming up. Time for getting that keto diet right? <laughs> because you mentally you're so much right. you're so, so much drops. focused, right? Right. And it just, yeah, and it, you know sometimes like you have these dips in the day, right? When you're in ketosis, you don't have those energy drops. You're feeling steady. You may be feeling high all the time. You know. Do you do you uh, ever implement like a sweet potato or sure. like before workout? Or yeah. So exactly. So now it's called targeted ketosis, right? Mm -hmm. And that will probably work for people, for most people who train. So now you train, right? Weightlifting. Yeah, weightlifting. Or so. Right. Uh, or, or, or intervals or something like that. Something relatively hard. So now your, your body's a little de depleted of glycogen and carbs, right? So now what do you want to do? Maybe half a sweet potato, maybe a cup of rice, and then you're golden, right? So now you're getting some carbs back, right? You, you don't, there's no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. Your body will get carbohydrates from other things, amino acids, right? Some amino acids, not all, all right? Also um, from the breakdown of fat. So you got triglyceride. The, the glyceride, the glycerol is going to be able to turn into carbohydrates as well. All so right, fats. And, yeah, right. Yeah, and then lactate, which is the byproduct of exercise. Yeah, you know that goes to the liver, and the liver does its thing and converts it back to glucose as well. So you don't think, and of course everybody's different. Uh, what you're saying, but you don't think we need nearly the amount of true carbohydrates than we that we think we do. I'm talking about Barry Fritz, yeah. he's 60 years right. old, right? right? So I'm not. I'm never going to be able to do what I once did in the gym. That's just forget about it. It's not going to happen, right? So I just basically want to feel good and still perform at a, at a, what I feel is a, a good level for even better than a 60 year old. Like if I if I'm training with some of my students who are in their 20s, you know, I still got that little eh, I like to kick their ass. You know what I mean? Right. So, <laughs> I mean that, 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 that used to that used to that used to be my goal when I was younger. Mm -hmm. If I would train with you, I would just say, "What the hell is this person I'm training with you for? I want to kill them." <laughs> <laughs> so, with, uh, <laughs> but it's not like that anymore. You know what I mean? What about people that? Uh, say they need the carbohydrates or because they feel awful without them just in the first couple of days you think if they get by that they'll feel a couple of days for some the lucky ones yeah uh, maybe two weeks for some others but um how many grams are you eating a day of carbs maybe 50. yeah because all, all my so here's the thing people say it's unhealthy and for some people it's not right again i'm not saying you should do ketosis all right maybe experiment with it though but the, we, we talked about it before you lose cravings yeah. And then when, when your client says to you, I have to have my bread. Yeah. Uh -oh. when, I was, when I was truly <laughs> in ketosis, and I did, you know, some of my triathlons on. Oh, you feel great. Ketosis, I felt phenomenal. Yeah. 
Yeah, the um, Spartan racers, so maybe yeah. something you might want to experiment with. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's an anaerobic component to Spartan racing, right? But it's not all anaerobic. And then, like I said, you still get, you still have some, you know, carbohydrates from your glycogen stores from other other factors. For sure. You know? It's definitely something to play with because you definitely do lo lose the cravings. Like, Absolutely. I did not want pizza. I did not want, I definitely didn't want fried foods. Nah. Definitely didn't want to eat like candy. Yeah. Like, and, For sure. You, know, you, you feel the way that you're supposed to feel when you eat that shit. Yeah. You know, you feel truly like, what did I eat? You know yeah. what I mean? This isn't supposed to go into the human body, yeah. you know? I remember a girlfriend one time, that was, I was at, so all summer I'm, I'm doing my thing, you know, I'm looking good, I'm feeling good, right? And she says to me one night, she goes, can we just go out like a normal couple? And I said, what does a normal couple mean? Like, go to a restaurant. And I go, okay, yeah. So just like at the end of the summer, I said, what's a, where do you want to go? Right. Let's go to this Italian place. Oh. I remember. Right, and Oh, uh, yeah. So I, so I broke down and ate that stuff. And we were in Ocean City, New Jersey at the time. And I remember I said to you, if pregnancy is anything like this, <laughs> and I'm dying here. And I mean, it felt disgusting. What about the distance between food? Like, you know, the duration of, of eating? Do you, you can do go a lot. So now you can go a lot longer without eating. Yeah, so right? that could that also like could that. be a detriment, right? Because I remember one time when things were really busy in life, you know, which we all get, I was, I went the whole day without eating. Right. I remember it was three o'clock in the afternoon, I still didn't eat. I remember thinking, I gotta eat something. Then something comes up, so you gotta address it again, right? So I went, so my last, my only meal was at nighttime. And you think, you know, if I was eating carbohydrates, I would've been racked. I would've had headaches, I would've had a mood, probably at, at lunchtime, right? But no, I just went, I went through it. I'm not saying to do that, just saying, right. you know. But you know, one of the things that the, the thing that's kind of being played around with now is intermittent fasting, right? So eating only for like six hours, as opposed to eating for, you know, doing the rate of the five meals a day. And again, maybe not the best thing for somebody who wants to gain muscle size, yeah. but if somebody might be want to be healthy, it might, it might be something they might want to experiment with. Because there is a lot of studies on what it's doing for like your metabolism. Um, and insulin levels, and I actually had someone on here, uh, Justin Rhinus, who he was a hunter, and he basically had to do that. And the intermittent fasting thing, I mean, there's convenience. I definitely do it sometimes, and um, it, there's convenience with it. And I'm someone who like just likes to consume a lot of food. Mm -hmm. So for me, like I, even if it's a salad with fruit and mm -hmm. avocados, you know, um, and even if that's like a 2,000 calorie meal, well, at least I get my fix of just chewing a lot, you know. Um, if you don't mind, we'll move on to muscle building. Um, what, what do you think the keys, actually let's start with strength training. So the keys is someone just wants to get strong, right? Mm -hmm. What do you think the keys to just getting strong are with weightlifting? Yeah, so, some of the keys um, need stability in whatever you're working. So you definitely need your client to stable. If you're unstable, you're not going to be very strong. So definitely a good stability. You know, but if you want to go like with the reps and things like the assignments, right? You know, five sets of five, like when I was younger, if I went to a big guy like that first gym I went to, and I said, I want to become big and strong. Five sets of five was always the answer. So that's what we do, five sets of five, all right? But then you start, then I read, I remember reading research out of East Germany, actually not out of East Germany, but it was from East Germany, Charles Bulkley. And he said, you know, it was showed in, from an East Germany study that 2.75, the average was 2.75, that seemed to give the best strength gain. So what are we, what are we doing now? Three, two to three reps, right? So you start your sets with three reps, and then you'll fatigue a little bit, and you can maybe drop down to two reps. So really heavy weight for a low amount of reps, like 2.75 to three reps. Yeah, not every time though. Right. You know, there's going to be times. So you're, there's going to. So let's say you do uh, squats twice a week, or let's say you train quads twice a week. One of them is going to be heavy. The other one might be just you know more bodybuilding oriented. Maybe speed work, or maybe um, just volume. You know, just to get the movement in. Like you, you know, just as a personal trainer, right? So the side you demonstrate on yeah. becomes really good. Right. Right? The other side you don't demonstrate on, mm -hmm. eh. So it shows you, like, you don't really need a, that second time or third time. If you're going to do, like, there was a study out of, uh, well, I forget the country it was from. I want to say Norway, but I could be wrong. All right? And they were, they were having people squat maybe nine times a week. And that was the thing. But it wasn't squatting heavy nine times a week, I don't think. Right? right. It was just practicing the movement. So practice the movement. So practice the movement as, as often as you can is definitely going to help. When you say nine times a week. Yeah, nine times a week. So nine times a week means you're doing it more than what? Two, 
do it twice a day sometimes. Wow. But you're not putting, again, one time a week you're hitting that bar really hard. And I'm not condoning it. I'm not saying you have to do that. Right. All right. But if, if your movement's not good, maybe you need to need the frequency. Yeah. Right. You have to, so you have to ingrain the pattern first. So get a good pattern and then start to challenge the pattern. Do you think you can get strong in moderate rep, moderate weight? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah absolutely. It might not be a topia, but you have to def definitely, you can get strong with 20 reps. Get strong with 30 reps. You're going to get strong. Yeah. Right? They're just, they're just you know, you're just, you're just better, possibly better ways to do it, if that's your thing. Before we move into that, um, do, if you go heavy, you know, how many times a month do you think that you can go heavy with, without uh, getting injured? So, like, we just talked about squatting nine times in a week. Yeah, but again, not heavy. Okay. Right, so, I'm trying, so I'm, 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 I'm grabbing a kettlebell, a, a dumbbell, and I'm doing some goblet squats. So but what about, like, true two to three reps, heavy back squatting, front squatting? How many times a month can you do that? Once a week. Yeah. Yeah. So, four times a month. Yeah. You should be all right with proper mobility, warm up sets. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And there's, there's, there's possibly people are going, but then you can squat again, again, just not what? Just not, just not heavy. Mm. You know? Right. The next day, moderate weight, moderate reps. So if you want to strictly build muscle now, right? Mm -hmm. um, if those are the keys to getting strong, you were talking about like 20 reps. Um, what do you think? The and they're generalizations. So, right. You know, there's, you know, there's individually, everything's individually based. Right. You know, training, you know, how long you've been training, exactly. how good you are at the yeah. movements. Um, what about specifically for building muscle? What do you think the keys are? So as I said earlier, so maximizing the contraction, right? So that's definitely a key, All right? So if I take a curl, yeah, I just flex and extend my elbow, right? But if I really just squeeze as hard as I can, just maximize the contraction, that's something that I think is big in, in developing you know, or increasing muscle mass. What about uh, rep schemes? Like, what are some of your favorite rep schemes? All, all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it could be six to 100. Mm. All right. So, and so when I, like I was 2014, I was big into the uh, 100 rep thing, mm. right? And I'm going to do 100 reps. But 100 reps wasn't like continuously 100 reps. I would do as many as I can, or I had my client do as many as they can. Let go of the bar, let go of the platform, or let, let go of the bar for a second. Shake it out and grab it and go again. Mm. All right. So it's, so it's multiple sets. But it's such limited rest. Like I would tell, ten seconds, ten seconds is too long, right? Literally, shake it out and go. All right. So it's a very uncomfortable way of training. Yeah. But it, it really works. I mean, I had a kid in, in one, one of my classes who's huge, and somebody you think was pretty close to his potential of getting a bigger arm. He got bigger arms. All right. Just by doing. And then all his friends would make fun of him because he's sitting there with these twenty. He's had these huge <laughs> arms, and he's using these twenty-five pound dumbbells. You know. So but volume, volume is important. Yeah. But even doing a hundred reps, you know, the same as strength. Like if you do that too often, you're going to get everything has to change. Right. Right. There's no such thing as like. like I remember the first time I did German volume training, ten sets of ten. Right. And I said, this is the magic because you do, you do one week. Just to make it simple. You, one week you're doing German volume. Second week you're doing conventional. Then rotate back to German volume. I said, this is the magic, and it worked for like twelve weeks, probably longer than anything I ever did. And then I said, I'll never have to change from this. I plateaued, mm. right? Time to change, right? So you know, it's not going to work now. Right. Your body's adapted, but I got good good results out of it. Do you um do do you, do you play with like tempos? Absolutely, tempos yeah. are yeah, tempos are great. You know, like when you're using that goblet squat, and it's a really obviously a sub max week. Don't go down. I, I like to settle on the bottom, so I usually have my clients just settle down there, right? So a two second down, for a three second down, and then hold the bottom for like a two count or a three count. And then come up on one. Don't stop at the top. Don't hold it for the top. Just go right back down again. So I, I like those tempos, you know. And then tempos are going to be different, but whether you hold, um, like here, here's one, 838s. I call them 838s. Right? And you're going to hold the end of the eccentric phase for 30 seconds. To the bottom. Yeah. So I, I think I learned this one from uh, this bodybuilder down in Florida. Uh, ben, uh, oh, Christ. Anyway, I'll go nuts if I try to read. But uh, <laughs> he has his own gym in Tampa. He's a professional bodybuilder. And then, so um, he would talk about this calves, right? For example, I'll give an example. So you go, you go down and dorsiflex, flex. And at the end of the eighth rep, you're holding it there for 30 seconds. And then you would come up, mm -hmm. right? So I have people do it on hip thrusters. So I have them hold it at the end of the eccentric phase and also the concentric phase. Just, again, change the tempo, change, give it different stimulus. So right? do eight reps, hold the bottom for 30 seconds. Or the top. Or the top for 30 right. seconds. And then and do another eight reps. Another eight reps. So now the weight, Ben Pekulski. Right. Yeah. So, but now the now the weight has to come come off. You know. 
Right. Let's take it down. Yeah. Um, what about like training splits then? Like you're saying, like you always switch it up one week, do higher reps, the next week conventional. Um, how many? Uh, I what, don't. Like, yeah, I don't do too much conventional anymore. My my mine's more higher reps at this point. Okay. Yeah. Do you do you train the same body parts like twice, three times a week? Like, what do you think for someone just the general population that wants to build muscle? Once their muscles change, so it's noticeable that they look different in clothing. Uh, two times a week. I think two times, times a, week a week is good. All right. Uh, for some of the smaller body parts, maybe more frequency. But you're saying general population. How much time do they have to spend in the gym? Right. Right. So they might only have two or three days. So then you take advantage of those those two or three days. Right. You know, if they can get in longer. So but smaller body parts, arms, delts, you know, posterior delts, especially. So those, those delts recover a little uh, quicker. So you know, maybe a little bit more frequency for them. So if, full if, body workouts. To, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So the one split I prefer, but it's not the only one I do. I like going from the, the hip hinge to pushing, right? So basically, I'm saying glutes and hamstrings with upper body pec tech. I mean pec tech. Pec, pec, pec major and, and delts. Right. Yeah, yeah. And then the next day would be quads. Squats. Quads. Right. That type, of, that type of thing. So I, I favor so that one. Apple, but that. then there's people that only see me twice a week. You got to do that all in one day. Right. You know. So then, but that's usually the sequence in which I go. Not always, but it's usually the same. A lot of people have a lot of difficulty understanding that to train hard for sometimes only 30 minutes or 45 minutes, you know, to, to an hour before your body goes catabolic and you start breaking down your muscle tissue, you know? So, yeah, if it goes catabolic, just eat. Right. You know, just, you know, it's, it's, you know it's, part of the, it's part of the process. But do you think more is better or less done well and harder? <laughs> All right, so let's go back. I'll go back to my second gym. All right, so which this place had actually <laughs> fixed dumbbells. That was the one I was telling you about. So the first, this first gym I didn't have fixed dumbbells. Second gym had fixed dumbbells, five to 110, and five pound increments, right? So I'm thinking like, oh my God, this place is heavy. Look at this, they have dumbbells here. Right? <laughs> right? And you take it for granted today, right? Yeah, except for the world, you can't buy it. Right? We're so naive to it, man. Yeah, now. So, yeah, and then anyway, so this guy had uh, the, got the owner of the gym, it was, Olymp it was Olympus Gym in Warrington, Hills Cleaners now. Um, 611 there, but point point being is um, he had connections with the West Coast bodybuilders, right? Right. And these guys were out through seminars or just come by and you know work out. I mean, it was, you know, I remember one time I walked in the gym. There's Dave Draper, you know, they called him the Blonde Bomber. He was working out, you know, asking questions. They were always pretty. They were actually cool dudes, right? But someone would give seminars, right? So I just go to the two extremes, but there's everything in between too, right? So Mike Mensa, Ray Mensa, like two or three work sets. Get the heck out of the gym. That's it. For two to three board. sets. Two or three Hell's Bells sets. Right. Right. Like how most just, people are not going to do. Yeah. Like, you ever, I don't know if you ever watched some of Dorian Yates. Like, Dorian Yates is kind of fashion, his protocols. Did you know him? Right? No, I never met Dorian. All right. But uh, and I didn't know any of these guys. I just met them. You know what I mean? But there, uh, anyway, so anyway, limited amount of volume, right? But very hard, right? Mm -hmm. And then you had this guy, Roy Callender. He says to me, So how many, how many hours do you work? And I said, At your job. I said, you know, eight, nine hours. He goes, my job is bodybuilding. I'm in the gym seven, eight right. hours a day. I'm like thinking like this guy. Right. Who, the, who the hell trains like that, right? But I remember when I was in there one time, he was in there training. And um, I did my whole protocol. He was there doing pull-ups already. I left, he's still doing pull-ups. I'm like, this guy's, this guy's right. serious. Yeah. And of course there's some enhancement involved with that. Yeah, absolutely. And their recovery and genetics, process. You know? Exactly what you're saying. Like. You know, if you're just general population, you don't have a cook and you don't have a, you know, a, a recovery machine like hot tubs and, you know, ice baths and yeah. you're not going to do all that stuff. You're going to have a tough time recovering, man. You're yeah. just not going to be able to stay in the gym that long. And, you know, in my opinion, I don't think you need to, you know. No. Um, if we, you know, one other big thing now uh, is, you know, the tension, the stress. So, like, yeah. to, to, to build a muscle <laughs> in one workout, if we were to do, like, uh, let's maybe give a, a butt workout, like three exercises for a butt workout and hips and hamstrings, mm -hmm. um, and then maybe a, a chest workout, okay. um, and just like three maybe variations of three different exercises for each. So we, we can start with the butt one, I guess. Okay, so glutes, right? Mm -hmm. So um, one the one exercise that's really in vogue is the hip thruster, right? And you know, everybody's doing hip thrusters for glutes, right? I I like to start out with. A mini band, or not start out with, but do a mini band above the knee, right? So something that stimulus to abduct into, and that will actually help contract the glute. 
And don't go, or have maximized the contraction of the glute, I should say, but don't go nuts on the weight. Like I drove a day where I would do this very heavy. Yeah. Again, put your, put your head in a muscle. And so now when you're in that flex position at the bottom, just really maximize the contraction. So focus on maximizing and don't worry about six to eight reps. Who the hell brags about on Facebook? I PR'd my, my hip thrust. So who cares? You know what I mean? So let's, let's do it for what it's there for. It's actually to, to help with um, the development of the glute, right? So the reps are high, you know, 15 reps, 20 reps. So hip thrusters with the band above the knee for, for higher reps. Yeah. And then sometimes if you don't want to focus on reps, because sometimes that's too much of a focus. I get to 20 reps, so it's, you know, it's too much. Maybe it's time under tension. You yeah. know, focus on the minute of time under tension. Three seconds down. Yeah, yeah so focus and then focus on. So now you're not even worrying about the volume. You're just worrying about the maximizing the contraction. Mm. So maximize the contraction is number, number one for any body part. Um, and in the proper form. So make sure you have a posterior pelvic tilt. All right, so a slightly flexed trunk, you know, um, drive off your heels, that type of thing. Right, abduct your hip. Right. So form is so important. And then um, uh, pull-throughs. I like pull-throughs. And we talked about it a little bit. So it's a hip hinge exercise, but it's mostly glutes. And pull-throughs really work well. I don't see a whole lot being done. And the setup position, again, the setup position, I would, I would focus on maybe two sets with the internally rotated hip, the toes together. And then just the opposite, toes apart. The the pull throughs where do you like bands or are you using um, I like, I like the tricep system. rope on the cable system? Yeah, I like cable system. Yeah. yeah. So it almost looks like a deadlift or a kettlebell swing. Or DL. Right, yeah. or DL. Or kettlebell swing would be a good way to mm -hmm. think about that, yeah. And then, and then I like quadruped hip extensions. So, you know, if, if my client is strong enough, I'll have them do a quadruped, quadruped hip extension on a leg press sled. Right? The, the, the sled itself, the frame itself, is about 90 pounds. So they, but you got to make sure you maintain proper form, right? If they can't do that, then I'll just put a, I'll have them in a quadruped position, put a dumbbell in their, in their, um, so with their other hands and knees. Yeah, exactly. And I'll put a dumbbell in their knee and then have them, you know, lift that or I'll unload the frame, the frame. So I'll just wrap a band around the frame, right? And then I'll unload it. It makes it a lot, a lot, a lot, uh, a lot lighter. Mm -hmm. so. so putting a band above the knee and doing hip thrusters. And then uh, pull, so for higher reps and really feeling the muscles. Yeah. Then pull throughs um, it, for moderate weight, moderate reps, and then ending with um, a high rep uh, prone hip extension. Yeah, uh, quadruped hip extension. Quadruped. Yeah, quadruped hip extension. Yeah, I mean, that's, again, that's, and there's another one too. I mean, most people don't work the glute and lateral rotation because it's really a tough one to focus on. All right, so people basically see your hands going from point A to point B. Yeah. All right. You got to focus on the hip rotate. Yeah. If you feel it in your trunk, you're doing the exercise incorrectly. Basically, the, the hands follow the hip rotation, right? And it's not very visual. That's one of the problems, right? But it's again, it's another exercise. What so about for uh, the pets? Three. Yeah, so, so, hold on. So, so yeah. Yeah, I really like uh, both feet elevated on a split squat too. Mm -hmm. So we elevate the front one and the back one. Or a step up with, that, with the position of the knee being above the hip. That really gives a lot of work to the glute as well. Mm -hmm. So I like those two, two for glute. So I already said three, but there's, there's a lot right. of different options. You know? Okay. And then uh, hamstrings, you know, RDLs are great. Um, I like RDLs with bands or chains. You know, that, that, that feels a lot better than just, because uh, you lose a little something at the top on an RDL. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you band it, you know, or you, or you use chains, it keeps the tension a little bit more consistent. You got a little bit more because you're losing the length of the moment on. So that actually, so what you're losing, you're going to gain with some chains and, and some bands. So that, that's a good one. You know, the kickstand version too, I've actually, I think I saw you do it. It's, it's not, a, it's, it's, it's a single leg stimulus, but both feet are on the ground. All right, so that's, I like that one for hamstrings a lot. You use it an awful lot. Where your foot's elevated on the, on the bench? No, no, it's just actually, so you're going to put your one leg that's, um, so both your feet are on the ground, but the other one's in a, like a, a plantar flex position. Yeah. Right? And so that side's not getting to work. The side that's not flat on the ground is getting, getting to work. I got it. Right? So that, I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. Squeeze it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, not, I'm not anti leg curl either. Right. And I'm not anti fall, all right, or supine jack knives. I got a new toy from Jackie Boys. There you go, Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, he's got this little sled and I attach a band to it. You know, I, 
Very cool. Yeah. What about for the pecs? <clears throat> um, if we were to do two. Just because we're kind of running short on time. Okay, yeah. Um, so pecs, I, I would say bench press mm. or very edge decline bench press. For me, be decline bench press doesn't work because I feel like my head's going to explode. All right? But if you, if you have a client that can tolerate decline, you look at all your pec fibers. They're all kind of in a good position to what? To pull. Right, so I would say if I had to pick one of the three, decline, flat, incline, I would do the decline. And then focus on the elbows coming to the center. So don't focus on, again, don't focus on the weights. It's so important. So your primary focus is bringing those elbows to the center, squeezing the living hell out of that bar. Almost like you could, if that bar could move, you would actually bring your hands to the center. Mm -hmm. And then that will maximize the contraction. Do you like dumbbells there, or do you mind using a barbell? I, I, I like dumbbells, but you, you you don't feel the contraction as much with dumbbells as you do with the bar. Yeah. All right? So dumbbells are great, don't get me wrong. And definitely you use dumbbells. But when you grab that bar, you can't do that, right? So you just got that excessive contraction as you, as you force that up your, your shoulder. Right. So. Gotcha. Are you big with push-ups? Push-ups are great. Dips. Right. Yeah, dips, push-ups are good. Dips gotta be careful with shoulder issues. Uh, I like your dip bar. I like the wide. I like the wider the better. Yeah. So you know you got a wider position as opposed to a nice and tight parallel. It's a little bit, a little tougher on the shoulder, but you know you kind of rock into it a little bit. A little more freedom. Yeah. So it's a little bit easier on the shoulder. But I use dips, um, and I, I use flies. I like cable crossovers. You know, again, you know if you're a function person, you know, I like cable crossover. But look at you know look at the pack, right? So the pack, you know, you can get it really long, you know, and then you come to it like a really short, so don't stop here, cross it over, get it really short. You know, just think of all the time, like I tell my clients all the time, you gotta get long on this one, get long, get long, or get short, get that muscle short. You know, it's constantly, I'm just telling that to the ones that have, you know, body awareness. You know, short so, meaning. So get that muscle as short as you possibly can. Right. So if I'm doing a cable crossover, most people stop here. Right. Right, why? Why not just do an explosive Finish crossover? Right. Yeah. So full range of motion matters, no momentum matters, yeah. no lifting. And then angles matter too. Yeah. Right? Like 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 a fly for for pec major. The resistance profile of a fly is really not too good. Yeah. Right? So one thing you could do, this is labor intensive, however, if you had cable systems, you could attach a cable to the dumbbell and now you have the cable. So now you have the cable at nine degrees here. So now now you have a ninety degree angle from your arm to the pulley system, right? So now you come up, you got the dumbbell. Now the dumbbell's not doing anything, but now let's right. take it over. Your pack. Your pack, right. right? So there's the other thing too, when you're using cable system, look at the 90 degree angle, right? So if, if I'm doing a lateral raise, right over the top every time, I'm only, I'm only training my, my delt, my middle delt, right. in a short position. Right. But if I turn on it, and the cable's here now, just change now the, the 90 degree angle's down here, and the, and the, and the delt is, is longer. Right. So constantly change angles. I mean, there's one lateral raise variation where I, don't even focus on the arm changing the angle. Like focus on the the torso changing the angle. So you're kind of leaning down on the bench like this. Yeah. And you're you're not going to rest your humerus on that on your lat. And so now all you're going to do is you're going to change your you're going to change your body position. And look look at the consistency in the moment arm. The distance from your 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 shoulder joint to, to the, the weight. Distance. Right. Like it's consistent, right? Right. So in my opinion, if, if I had to say there's a best lateral raise, this is it. The only, the only thing it's a left side, right side. How much time do you want to spend on that? Right, raises, right. You know, so. So it can take you 10 minutes on these lateral raises. Yeah. And then, are you careful with flies and laterals for people with shoulder pain? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, flies might be a, might be a bad one. Absolutely. Um, I hate to wrap this up, but the one last thing I think that we should end with, from someone with the amount of experience of training people that you've had, and again, I can't thank you enough for doing this. Oh, thanks for having me. Um, you, for, for how do you keep your clients from all the clients that you worked with and all the students that you work with? Because you know, us trainers need motivation too. Us trainers have to, you know, stay accountable and detail oriented and motivated enough to stay motivated to train our clients as well. But specifically like clients, uh, for, for staying motivated to work it out, ourselves included, mm -hmm. trainers, um, how do you keep people uh, goal oriented and connected to their goals and, and accomplishing goals. Yeah, so they just they need to want it really. Yeah. I mean, I don't have a magic. Like, there's definitely a thing on psychology and things like that. Like you said, writing goals down and things, and they look at the refrigerator and 
they might have a picture or something that they might want to look, like, look at or something like that, or you know, maybe their jeans they want to fit into, like Alan uh, Cosgrove. Cosgrove, yeah. I think it was his wife actually said it. You know, they had to buy jeans and they, they buy them, they're too small, but that's their goal to fit in those jeans. So there, there are things that can act, actually work, but you know, it's very frustrating for us as personal trainers where the client trains like a beast. Like they're getting strong, right? Their performance is just tenfold better than what it was before, right? And their body composition hasn't changed too much. Why? Because the weekend comes, right? And it's the weekends that kill. Then you know, the people have this um, disconnect. This though. disconnect with their goal, right? right? And they deserve that, that treat, right? They deserve the margaritas. They deserve the tacos that are flopping all over the table. So that, that stuff doesn't help you get to your goal, but here you go. If you go keto, you're not going to run. Keto, right. right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's two different things. Like once you get to the goal weight that's healthy in the doctor's office and you are looking good in the jeans, if that was your goal, then you can play around a little bit more. But if you spend four days out of the seven days of the week doing good, and then you spend three days eating for three people, man. It's going to, it's going to take you a couple of days just to get back to normal. You get your insulin levels and your cortisol levels all back to normal. You're, you're just, you just ruined it. You just yeah. ruined it. Three days is just way too much. For sure. Of a problem, right? But here's what something else happens. Like occasionally, gym members will come up to my clients and go, "Hey, I'm seeing a big difference in you." Oh my God, there you go. You know what I mean? Like I say it. Oh yeah, yeah, you're my trainer, yeah. Right? But if someone from they have really no connection with says it, they really get they really, really get motivated. For sure. You know? And and then the thing that's really different in gyms today too is there was a team effort. Like that's why CrossFit's so popular. That's why. You know, you're so popular, and Carl Seifron is popular, and Dan Dan Bowen so sad, and Tommy DeVitra, right? And I could go on and on, so I just run out of time and spend the rest of the listening. But you guys are so popular. <laughs> yeah, but, but you guys, you guys are so popular because why? Wasn't the team, uh, uh, the team, team atmosphere? The team yes. atmosphere, right? You yeah. guys have teams, right? So back when I first started, the second gym I went to, if you were going for a PR, could have been 100 pounds or 500 pounds. Right? The whole <laughs> gym would stop. Oh, right. Right? That's happening in your team environment, right? That's not happening on one on ones. That's not happening. If you, I don't even know what my my uh, my peers are doing for one arms anymore, right? But back then you knew, right? right. So yeah, here's Joe Balloon. She's just trying this one arm, 100 pound bench press. Hey, Barrett, Joe's going for a PR. Everybody stops. Yeah. And then everybody stops. Everybody's high fiving, right? So the high energy in the gym just became what? Tenfold higher, like every you just won the super. Tom just won the Super Bowl with a hundred pound bench press, right? So is he going to be motivated to come in again? Of course, absolutely, right? Of course. So, so that so the team environment, I can see why people love group training. You know, you have your six o'clock team, you have your seven o'clock team. Yeah. You know, and it's 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 you know it's you know it's all it's all part of it. I think for us too as trainers, you know, to the way um, that we have like our organic network, you know, and a lot of people. I uh, think in some ways that we're kind of crazy because we all work together to try to learn, you know, the, the latest and greatest of what we can apply to uh, help our clients the best that we can, uh, again, with safety and effectiveness. And a lot of people look at it like it's a competition, but it's, it's so not. No, it's that's such a short term style of thinking. Yeah. And when everyone's working together and everyone's supporting each other, and we realize how hard this field is with the mood changes and you know what we're promised versus what we're delivered. You know, and uh, our our ability just to study, like we were talking about in the beginning. You know, like for instance, we had a whole day today, and now we're here just grinding away in, in the gym, talking about gym stuff yeah. late at night. You know what I mean? And then we're probably going to go home, and you're probably going to look at some of the books they have on the shelf, and I'm probably going to listen to a podcast of some sort. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I think. Uh, in order to be able to do that, there's an intrinsic side, of course, but there's some of them, and that's why I can't thank you enough, but you need uh, the mentors of your caliber, you know, uh, someone like yourself. You have to get yourself a mentor that you can learn from and learn the way, and then 